Hey, welcome to our Memorial Day service. I'm sorry that you were not able to make it in person today, uh, but we did want to bring you uh, the message and a little bit of music and let you know what's going on around River Ridge. Uh, so first of all, I uh, want to let you know that next Sunday uh, after church, we're going to have a outdoor baptism. And so after the second service, we'd love for you to join us down at the river uh, to see folks be baptized. Uh, also want to let you know that the week of June the 12th, we are starting Summer Life, uh, and that will be opportunities to gather outside for a variety of activities. There'll be um, Ultimate Frisbee, there'll be um, uh, mountain biking and different things like that. So if you want to go to uh, riverridge.church, click the Sign Up for Anything button. Uh, you can find out all about that sort of thing. Uh, and then also, if you are in middle school or high school, or you have a middle schooler or a high schooler, uh, we have the Emerge Camp, uh, and that's going to be at the beginning of July, uh, and would love to have you sign up for that, sign your kids up for that. It's going to be an incredible experience uh, to go to Fayetteville area of West Virginia, do some outdoor stuff, uh, worship, learn about Christ and following Jesus, and also meet up with some folks uh, from our River Ridge Taze Valley Church uh, and other folks just to be encouraged in the Lord. So that's what's going on uh, coming up at River Ridge. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Gerald, and uh, he's going to lead you in a song, and then I'll be back and share the message with you.
All right. Hey, I'm really excited to uh, bring this message to you uh, via video, even though you're not live in the parking lot uh, with us uh, for Memorial Day Sunday. Uh, and super excited about what I have to share and what God has put on my heart uh, for this morning. Uh, I want to start with a, a story, and we're in the middle of this series called uh, Wiser, and we're looking at it, how do we glean wisdom and apply God's wisdom to different areas of our lives. Um, but I want to take you back to when I was in fourth grade. I went to uh, Shawnee Elementary uh, School in Indian Hill, uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. And so every uh, lunch recess, a group of kids would play kickball. And so they would choose up sides and so forth. Um, and, and what they would do, and I, and I remember this so distinctly, is, is one team would be at bat or at kick, I guess if you call it kickball, but they'd be at bat. Uh, and they would go through and, you know, get guys on base or whatever, score runs, and then when there's three outs, then that team goes in the field, and then the other team comes in and bats. Like, you know, that's what kickball works, you know that. So, uh, but here's what I remember so distinctly is uh, I would be on the team, and I felt like this happened every day at recess. I would be on a team, our team would kick, we'd have our at-bats, we'd go in the field, and, and I was a kid, like, I was not, like, the worst athletically inclined kid, but I certainly wasn't at the top. And so I'd be kind of in the middle or the bottom of the order of the kickball lineup. And there'd be, you know, maybe 10 or 12 kids on the team, maybe 15. Uh, and so it would be our turn to come back to bat or to kick. And, and the captain of the team, who was always the coolest, most athletic kid, uh, would always yell, top of the order. And so they would go back to the top of the batting order uh, and so I never would get to kick or to bat in kickball. And and that phrase, top of the order, has always, like, made me cringe because it was like that person, my peers, were saying, you're not good enough. You're terrible at kickball. We don't want you to bat. We don't want you to kick. Uh, and I still, like, have very vivid memories of that um, because those were hurtful words that were directed, not necessarily at me in particular, but directed at People like me um, who were at the bottom of the order and they go top of the order and then they start with the batter number one. And it's kind of funny. I was playing kickball with some guys from the tennis team about two weeks ago and there was like six of us on each team. And it was like a, a deja vu in a bad way. We played kickball. I'm like, oh, I remember those days. And I felt so bad because of those hurtful words towards me. And, um, you know, we have all heard those wounding words, those hurtful words in our lives. Um, but the flip side is also true that that most of us, uh, I'd say all of us, have spoken those hurtful words to somebody else. Um, and, you know, there's a phrase that, that we learned when we were in grade school, I suppose, or maybe that we've even said to our kids. Um, but it's, it's the adage, uh, sticks and stones, might break my bones, uh, but words will never hurt me. Um, and the fact is, that's a flat out lie. Uh, that I have, you know, I have stitches across my nose and stitches different places and I broke my arm falling off a ladder and, and I don't really have any trauma from those things. Um, but I still remember top of the order and it's still a bit wounding for me. And so words really do hurt us. Um, and, and sometimes we're on the receiving side, um, but the reality is there's times when our words hurt somebody else. Um, and so we're going to talk about that this morning. I want to read to you from uh, the book of Proverbs, and we're going to be in James chapter 3 most of this morning, um, but I want to read to you what it says in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18. It says, there's one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. And I love that verse because there's this idea, this sense of my words can either be a sword that wounds or my words can be a healing touch to somebody else. Um, and so we're going to talk about like, how does that happen? Why does that happen? How do we land on one side instead of the other? And so uh, James, uh, who is the brother of Jesus, writes this uh, letter and, and gives some great insight into why and how of the words that we use. Uh, so it begins like this. It says, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Um, and he uses that word teachers, and really that's all of us. Uh, or maybe not all of us, but most of us are teachers. You know, if you are actually a teacher, uh, if you are 
a parent, if you are the boss of somebody and have an employee, if you are an older sibling of somebody, we all have these situations where we are teachers and it says they'll be judged more strictly and what's going to follow is a discussion about words because the fact is when we are in a position of authority or leadership or teaching over somebody, our words wound more you know, more deeply, they wound deeper. Um, by the same token, the words that we speak are more life-giving um, when they're words of encouragement or words of affirmation. So he continues and he says, For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body. Um, and this is the idea that, that all of us stumble, all of us struggle with our words. There's nobody who has perfect words all the time. Um, and so the question, that's the question. The answer is like, how do we, how do we deal with that? How do we respond? So James continues on, he says this. He says, if we put bits in the mouths of horses so they, they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. They are, though they are so large, are driven by strong winds. They are guided by a very small rudder whatever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And, and I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, if you listened uh, to the first message about marriage. And when, when the author in the Bible, when a Bible author uses or says the same thing three times, it's kind of like them putting it in bold font, you know, 120 point font underlined saying, pay attention to this. And, and that's what happens here. He, he uses three illustrations to say the same thing. He says um, a bit in the mouth of a horse. So a little bitty bit, you know, about four inches controls this thousand pound beast. Uh, and then we have the rudder of a ship. And the rudder of a ship is typically about one one thousandth, one one thousandth trying to say that, uh, of the size of a ship, and that steers it through the wind. Uh, and then a small spark, just a match, just a tiny spark, can set an entire forest on fire. The point that, that James is making is that, that though our tongue is small, and though our words might be just short words or a phrase or a sentence, they have this incredible power, this huge effect on other people even though they are small words or that our tongue is so small. Then it continues on, and this is verse 6. And it kind of adds to this idea of having a huge impact with our tongue. It says this. It says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, straining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life um, and set on fire by hell. And that verse adds to it, it adds to the, really to the dangerousness of our words, that we, we speak these words and they can have incredibly negative, horrific effects on other people, disastrous effects on how they are received. And it continues on. It says this in verse 7. It says, for every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Um, and that sounds pretty fatalistic, uh, that no one can tame the tongue. It, it, it can't be tamed. We can tame beasts, we can tame lions, we can tame you know, dolphins that live in the sea to make them do what we want. Uh, but nobody can tame the tongue. No person can tame the tongue. Um, and it kind of so sounds sort of fatalistic, but there's also an answer that James is going to give. So it says this, verse 9. It says, With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. But the same mouth, with, uh, from the same mouth come blessing and cursing, my brothers, these things ought not to be. Does a spring pour forth the same opening from fresh and salt water? 
Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. And what he's getting at here is that what comes out of our mouth is what is inside of us. So if you have a, a freshwater spring, it's going to produce fresh water. If you have a saltwater spring, it's going to produce salt water, not fresh water. If you have a fig tree, it's going to produce figs. If you have a grapevine, it's going to produce grapes. Yeah, that's what he's saying. And so the idea here is we speak the words that we speak because of what is inside of us. It, it just it just comes out. Uh, and so Jesus said this. He said, For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so we go back to what James said, and he says, No one is able to tame the tongue. So what are we to do? And the answer comes with this understanding that we, in and of ourselves, we can't tame the tongue, but God can. There's a great line that Jesus says in a different place, a different context. But he said, uh, with man, it is impossible. With God, all things are possible. And so when we talk about taming the tongue, we talk about using our words in a wise way. It means that we need to look to God to change us from the inside out. Um, and so what I want to do is I want to close uh, with a bit of application and give you uh, an alliteration, three things uh, that will help you and to help us with, in terms of God changing us from the inside out. And I'll give you it up front. It's, it's um, pause, ponder, and pray. Okay, so the first is pause. James um, one nineteen says this. He writes, Be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And so before we speak, just pause, just wait a minute, just stop. Because so often the things that come out of our mouths that are most harmful are things that we don't think about. They just, they, they, they spew out of our mouth and we wish we could just take them back in because we know they're harmful, but they come from the heart. They come from what's within us. We want to shove them back in our mouths because we see somebody who is hurt or crying or disturbed because of what we said but it's too late once they're out. And so the first is we just pause, be slow to speak. Here's the second. Um, it's ponder, ponder. And I want to read to you from uh, Proverbs 25, uh, verse 11. Proverbs 25, 11 says this. It says, A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold, in a setting of silver. And, and so when we think about this idea of ponder or, or pause for a moment and think, it, it's this idea that we always have this opportunity to say words that are harmful or words that are helpful. And, and this verse says, a word fitly spoken or a word aptly spoken. And to be honest, I don't use the word fitly in my vocabulary, and I don't use the word aptly in my vocabulary. So I kept reading a couple different translations, um, and, and the one that resonated with me the most was a word that is timely spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. In other words, it's this idea that when our words of encouragement, when our words of affirmation are timed up well, it is life-giving to somebody. It's like an apple of gold in a setting of silver. And so I encourage you, in that, you, you pause, and then you ponder, you say, what could I say that what comes out of your mouth would be words of affirmation, would be words of encouragement to whomever you're speaking to. And then the last P is pray. So we pause, we ponder, and we pray. And uh, there's a great verse that sums this up so well, I think. This is Psalm 19, uh, verse 14. It says this. It says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Uh, and I love that because it, it's the meditation of my heart, it's the words of my mouth, and if, and if it is acceptable to God, then it's going to be acceptable encouragement to somebody else. Um, and so that's what we want to do with our words. Uh, so we pause, we ponder, 
and then we pray. Yeah. I want to close with one last story. Uh, and this goes back about 21 years ago. Um, and uh, as some of you know, I was on staff at Chestnut Ridge Church in Morgantown, West Virginia, uh, for a couple of years, kind of trying to figure out what God wanted me to do with my life. And the pastor there uh, was Tim Herring. Uh, and great pastor, great speaker, great communicator, great sharer of the gospel, great vision for what the church could be. Um, and, and he was pastoring at Chestnut Ridge, and I was a part of it, and I, and I loved the church. And I can remember we were walking together, and, and God was beginning to put on my heart this idea of planting a church in Charleston, West Virginia. It didn't even have a name yet. It was, we kind of, which it didn't have any, it was like the Charleston Church Plant. Um, and I can remember having this conversation with Tim, again, a guy that I respected so much. And he said these words, and they were apples of gold in a silver setting. He said, Matt, I would love to go to a church where you are the pastor. Um, and I still remember those words today. I could tell you exactly where we were when he said that we were outside of a Waffle House. Uh, and, but those words were fitly spoken, aptly spoken, so timely in my life. Um, and we have that opportunity with the words that we speak to bring life, to bring help to people. Um, and so I want to encourage you, uh, as you go about your day, as you go about your week, to do these things, to pause, to ponder, to pray that your heart is changed so that what is inside of you begins to change and is more and more like Christ. And then when that happens, what will flow out of you are words of Christ, words of affirmation, words of encouragement, words of truth um, couched in grace. Um, so that's my challenge and encouragement to you today. So let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today, Lord. Thanks for the gift of technology, and I pray that you would help each one of us um, to speak words of life to one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for being with us. I hope you have a great rest of your day and a great Memorial Day weekend. We will see you next Sunday uh, at River Ridge Church.